the Uppsala Child and Baby Lab is a rather large lab. We're 40 researchers and PhD students, and we have about 3,000 visits each year from families and infants. As we're a rather big research group, we do research in many different domains of child development. Now in infancy, we focus a lot on social cognition in infancy, perception and attention. Later on in life, it becomes very important with executive control functions. Uh, attachment is something we look at quite a lot. And we also look at different clinical groups, uh, children with ADHD or an autism diagnosis. One of the core questions that we're interested in answering uh, has to do with the social development early in life. How infants come to understand other people and the actions they perform. Now we have a, an idea that the infant's own motor development is very important here. So when an infant starts to actively explore the environment and learn to move around and handle their own body, they also learn about other people indirectly. And this connection between one's own motor development and active exploration and cognition, and particularly social cognition, is one important area of research. Well, doing research with infants is tricky as is all research, I guess. But the particular challenge of working with young humans is that we can't really give them instructions uh, and we can't really ask them questions and expect always to get a very good answer back, particularly when we deal with infants. So we need to find situations that are playful and meaningful for the child so that the child, him or herself, wants to participate. And if we design these play situations in a smart manner, we are able to extract information about cognitive mechanisms that guide that infant or child's understanding of the world. And at the end of the day, that those mechanisms and the development of them is what we're after. Traditionally, when investigating young infants, there has been a few techniques that people have used. Habituation or preferential looking or socially or just interacting with the infants. Now all of these are good, valuable methods, but they also carry limitations. And one of the limitations is that you get very little data. So an infant participating in an habituation paradigm, you only get one data point, whether they dishabituate or not. But with eye tracking, we could ask so much more and we get so much richer information, both in terms of longer processes, how they evaluate things, but also on the very small microstructure of event, how they see things as they occur in real time. And this is a big advantage that we can't really get with any other technique. There's of course many things you can do with eye tracking data and many different paradigms that can be applied. But there are two particular paradigms that we've focused on that have given, we think, unique insights. One has to do with the ability to foresee the future. So if I'm performing an action, if I'm reaching for a cup, for example, what an infant that is able to reach themselves will do is that they will look at my hand disengage from this hand and fixate the cup before my hand arrives there. So this is actually they're predicting what's going to happen in the future on a short time scale, but still. Now these types of abilities we did know, not know that infants had prior to eye tracking because this requires information that's accurate about where they're looking in real time and how their gaze shifts very subtly and very quickly in relationship to perceived events. And here eye tracking is perfect for this. Another paradigm which we have started to use and we think is very promising for the future uh, involves looking at pupil dilation. Now the pupil dilates when you enter a room that's dark in order to bring more light into the eye. That's not what we're after. What we have noticed and what others also have shown is that the pupil also dilates as a function of attention and arousal. So by presenting something that is cognitively challenging or surprising to an infant, we're able to record that surprise reaction within the infant just by recording fluctuations of the pupil. And this, is, I think, opens up a, a, for a lot of new interesting studies. And this is something we've just started, but this has the future, I think.